Okay. You're on. Oh, I'm on. Hey, y'all. I'm James Wright, and welcome to my shop. This is what you call fantastic husband and wife or com oh. communication. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Communication goes both ways, and my way didn't work this time, apparently. This time. <laughs> so, welcome to Wood by Wright Live, where I uh, drive myself into the doghouse every week. <laughs> And uh, we're going to be having a little bit of fun today, finishing up or uh, doing the glue up, hopefully, on the uh, the flower planter that we're making. Tonight we're going to be putting the bottom of it, so we have a groove made in from last time. We did the dovetails, but we need to get a bottom into this thing, and then hopefully do a uh, glue up on it as well, which should be a lot of fun. Uh, for those of you who are new, uh, if you are watching this live, then go ahead and throw any questions you have in the comments. If you are not watching this live, then look down below in the description. I have all the questions that have been asked with a timestamp beside them, so you can jump around in the video and go to what you want on that. Um, yeah, um, we'll probably be doing a giveaway later. Um, I forgot to do it last week. Sorry about that. But we'll be giving away um, probably another card scraper. I think I have one. Yeah, I got one. I need to give away. Uh, what else do we have? Oh, this weekend is uh, the Midwest Tool Collectors Meet here in Loves Park, and it's just a couple miles away from me. So if you ever remember, if you are a member with uh, the Midwest Tool Collectors, you've already gotten an invite. Um, if you are not, you can come to the Speedway. Uh, it's the Rockford Speedway, and it is uh, it will be starting at 8 a.m. And you can pay at the door to become a member, and then um, then come in. Is it but, uh, the Speedway or is it the Forest Hills? It's the Forest Hills Lodge at the Speedway. Lodge, yeah. Um, well, I don't want them going into the Speedway thinking yeah. that it's... <laughs> Go where all the cars are at. Um, well, race day is Saturday. Yeah. Well, no, it's on Sunday, not right, not Saturday. The 13th? No. Uh, and then also on uh, May, mid-May, less than, less than a month away, we will be, or no, a little more than a month away, we will be in... Uh, um, What's the name of the city? In the London? UK. Um, north of London. Oh, Birmingham. Birmingham, there's one. <laughs> the UK at the uh, Makers Central. So my wife will also be there for that. So looking forward to that. Now forget anything before we dive in? I think that's about it. So let us dive into this project and get a know. bottom are, end Are it. we dredging up? I'm sure they'll come up in yet? the chat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> If you've been watching the uh, the Wood by Right Hive Mind um, group on Facebook, um, yeah, Alan and I have been driving ourselves into the doghouse with my wife, so uh, it's been interesting over there. I'm I'm pretty sure there's a couple hot chocolates coming my way. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, tonight we've got uh, the flower planter here, and before we put a groove all the way around in this, and now we need to make a bottom for it. And so for that, I have this board here which is longer and wider and thicker and we need to make this fit down below. So what I'm actually going to be doing is basically like a raised panel door where you'd have a, a, a pillowed door frame. So you have the groove that the main panel sticks out of. We're going to be doing basically the exact same thing in this so that it uh, fits in the bottom. It will be slightly pillowed in the bottom. And that's okay. It's actually going to stick down a little bit lower than the bottom of the frame here which if it were a box it was supposed to sit on the ground might look interesting because it would actually lift the frame off of the, the surface a little bit. But in this case, it's going to be attached to the building uh, through the box itself. So it's going to be hanging down below, no issue at all. So first thing we need to do is actually measure this thing out and find out what size this needs to be. Uh, before I dive into that, do we have any questions or anything early? Um, anything so, Moonwolf71 wants to know if you're going to fill in the holes so you don't drive your wife nuts. No. No, I, I drive my wife nuts on purpose. As I say, he enjoys it. <laughs> Here, let me move this camera in a little bit. So, let's find out. Oop, don't push that button. What uh, we need to find out here. Oop, not that one. Ah. Let's try this one. Hey, there we go. So we've got our box here, and we need to find out what is the groove size on this. Now, normally, you can actually get a tool that measures the groove to groove size, um, but in this case, I don't have that tool, and I've always planned on making one of those tools that basically sticks that slide past each other and fit into the groove, so you can measure inside the groove and inside the groove vertically as well as horizontally. Um, and every time I think, oh, I should make that, it's just quicker to measure it out, so I don't do that. So what I basically do is I'll take this and I'll go, all right, it is, we're at 19 and just shy of three quarters. 
and I know that my groove is a quarter inch deep and a quarter inch deep, so if I add a half inch onto that, I'm at just shy of 20 and a quarter inch. Now, the board that I'm putting in here <laughs> isn't going to expand Wait, did something just go on? Uh-oh. Oh, you just turned on my lava lamp. Oh, I can't bring it up. All my cords are tied up in there. Sorry, Alan. Uh. Hot chocolate in the front. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all got to go on the wood by right hive mine. <laughs> and for those of you who are new here, um, if you do a super chat, you also He's get a He's measuring document joke. this day. <laughs> what was that? Tim Sheetwood said, he's measuring documents. Yeah, yeah, we'll get to the measuring here in a moment. Um, I thought about going on an all almond all almond diet. But, but it sounded nuts. That's just nuts. That one is just, no. Oh, does that mean you need to do another one? Okay, yes, that, that's too easy. Um, what is brown and sticky? A stick. <laughs> Sorry, that's a joke from my high school days. <laughs> I don't know, that one's no longer a dad joke, is it? <laughs> Let's get back to this. Um, but thank you for the hot chocolate, Alan. Yeah, uh, so what we want to do is measure in here, and we were at 19 and 3 quarters. I want to add a half inch con because I have a quarter inch groove and a quarter inch groove. That puts us at 19 and a quarter, actually just shy of 19 and a quarter. Now, wood expands and contracts this way across the grain. It doesn't expand and contract any measurable amount lengthwise, at least nothing in like 19 inches. So I can cut it to the exact length. I'm actually going to cut it's it a great. little bit shorter, like a 32nd, 64th, or uh, I'll probably end up cutting like a full eighth shorter. Um, and then I also want to measure its width. Now this would be the problem because if I have one of those stick measuring width, it would work this way, but it wouldn't work this way because it's so thin. In this case, I know it's what, five inches across, and so I can add on the quarter inch from this groove and the quarter inch from that groove. I come up to five and a half. Now here, this board is going to want to expand and contract this way, especially since this is going to be outside. It's going to have water dumped directly on it. The expansion and contraction this way is probably going to be as much as an eighth inch or actually a little bit more than an eighth inch. Um, there are several places online where I can go and actually calculate that all out and measure out exactly what will the expansion contraction capabilities of white, excuse me, white oak be over a five inch wide board. But just from experience, I know that it is going to be uh, a little bit more than an eighth inch. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to leave a little bit more than an eighth inch difference in there. So if it needs to be five and a half inches, then I'm gonna bring it down to, what is that five and three eighths inch, and a little bit less than that. So I'll probably do about five and a little more than a quarter. Um, for those of you in the metric system, it would be a lot easier for calculating than it is in the English system. And thankfully, I've measured, put all those measurements down already so we can get to working on this. So the first thing I want to do is get this board, and I want to joint one edge so that I know one edge is true. And then we're going to cut it to length. But before I do that, I forgot to check this one to see if the end of this is square. And the end of this is square-ish. Let me show you how far out it is. And a lot of people are going to like, oh, that's not square. I put this on there. You can see there's a gap in the middle, but it's touching here at this end and here at this end. And this whole thing is really ragged and rough. But in all honesty, that is completely within variance because that's all going to be inside of a groove. So I'm not going to clean up this end. That amount of wo woeful movement of about an eighth inch is perfectly fine for this. So I put this in a vise, joint this end flat. And then we'll have a true edge that we can do all of our working on. Now, because the camera is over there, I'm going to run into issue because I've got to work on the other side of the board. And so we're going to just see where it hits. So it's hitting here, missing here, hitting here, missing here. So I'm just going to work here in the middle. Wow, that's like looks like me. What's that? I said that's what it looks like every time I do it. <laughs> <laughs> and what I do want to do here in the middle. I want to basically belly this out. I want to create a curvature. Let me move that up a bit. My camera's down low, sorry. That way. So basically, I want to create a curvature this way so that this end is low. And that will let me know that I can basically flatten it out. So I'm going, and now it's, it's not getting anything here in the middle. It's just sliding on top of the board. So that lets me know that the depth of my cut here is probably 
I'm doing about four thousandths of an inch deep. Over the distance of this plane, that's how much of a sway in this I'm going to have. So now I'm going to back up, go from end to end. Boop, went off the side. This white oak is really, the grain is going up and down and up and down. And I'm going to go until I get one good shaving from one end of the board to the other. That was close. Still a little bit missing here. Just like that. One shaving end to end, full width. And now I know that this is flat enough. Now, if I really wanted to, I could back off this iron and make it even lower and I could flatten it out even closer or I could get a longer jointer plane or I could get out my straight edge and make sure everything's perfect. But because all of this is gonna be inside of a groove and I'm gonna have it outside, this whole thing is gonna be expanding and tracting, that is flat enough. Now we can actually do all of our measurements off of that. So, let's do this like Brutus. I was waiting. Any questions while I'm setting this? No. Oh, okay. Quiet chat tonight? I think they're just watching for a moment. So first thing we need to do is take its length and ahead of time before I wrote them all down so I wouldn't forget. It's always an important thing. Measure three times, cut four times, and it's still too short. Oh. Uh, I want to go 20 and an eighth. It was going to be 20 and a quarter, but I'm going to cut it a little bit shorter just to make sure that it fits in. And put the square on there. I'm going to reference the square. So the, the reference edge of the square is going to go against that side that I just planed down. I don't want to put it against the rough side that hasn't been planed down yet. Put that on there. Put my knife into the line. Slide the square up against it. Draw my line. Light, medium, hard. And we've got that line put in. Now, I need to make it uh, at 5 and 3 eighths inch wide. So if I put this on here and I measure out 5 and 3 eighths inch wide, I'm going to be left with about 3 quarter inch strip on this board that I need to cut off. Now, I could plane it all down to that, and 3 quarter inch is probably going to go pretty quickly. Or I could take it over to the saw and cut that out, which is what I'm going to do. But first, let's put a line on there. Grab panel gauge, and a panel gauge is a marking gauge with a lo longer beam and a bigger fence. Loosen this up a bit. Slide it up to five, and just a hair short of three eighths. Check it to make sure. Tells him that the measurement is 20 and a quarter, not 19 and a quarter. What did I say? Did I do say 19? I, you must have. Measure twice. Says the person whose name yes, is cut 20, twice. Yes, 20 and an eighth. <laughs> <laughs> the name is cut twice. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, 20 and an eighth, not 19 and an eighth. Um, so we set the panel gauge up to that, and now we can use the panel gauge to mark its width. And the reason I'm doing both these marks now is I'm going to take it over to the saw bench and just do both of the cuts over there. It's a little bit easier if it's all marked out ahead of time. There we go. So now let's go over to the saw bench and have a little bit of fun. And the saw bench is something that scares a lot of people. So I want to talk a little bit tonight about methodology of sawing. Any questions on setting up? There are a couple. Okay. Okay, I gotta find them now. Hang on. La, 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 la. Oh, JJ Nitz asked, I know you love working with white oak. Does ash work similarly to white oak? Is the grain pattern similar between the two woods and do they finish similarly? Um, actually, ash is a little bit easier. Uh, ash is fairly similar in that it has a lot of, um, it's ring porous, so it, it follows with the grain well, it splits easily, it's very stringy. Um, but white oak tends to be far more um, twisted and mangled, so here you can see a lot more figure, the grain goes up and down. Um, so ash is actually a little easier to work with than white oak. White oak is a very hard wood to work with. Um, what was the second half of the question? Does it finish similarly? Yeah, yeah, they, they have a very similar finish. And you can actually make ash look a lot like white oak if you stain it because they have a very similar um, ring structure. 
So what I want to do in here, let me make sure you can see my arm. I have to pan up a little bit more so you can actually see all the trash in my shop. And my wife in the background, you get to see her twice. So I put one knee on here, and you can always set the height of your bench by stand on one leg and put your knee down, and you should have about one inch in between your knee and the bench so that that one inch can get it filled with the board you're working on. And then this also allows your body to get out of the way because you want your saw to be in line with the arm, in line with the elbow, all the way up the shoulder, everything to be nice and straight. You don't want to be bending over like this, making your arm go out of the way, and you don't want to be way over here making your arm go out of the way. You want it all to be right in line. Pinch the board, start the nick, and cut the board. Side a little bit. Now you can see right here, I'm actually causing the saw to cant out that way, which I don't know if you can see it in the video, but uh, you may have heard, bit. you may have heard as I'm sawing, you'll hear the end going flap, 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 flap. Yeah, we hear so it. I want to show you that. <laughs> You can see the end of the saw going, and as I pull it back up, the end of the saw springs a lot more. And what I'm doing here is my arm is out of line here, and my, hands, my saw is starting to bend over this way. And so that's an indication that my hand is coming over this way, so I need to bring my hand back this way, bring my shoulder back here, and get my body out of the way. Also, this saw is fairly dull. That's why that cut took so long. But now let's do the long rip. And for that, I'm gonna get my big saw. What questions do we have? Um, Doug Gatton asked, do you make your dovetails smaller for hardwoods? Um, you can. You don't have to. You can make dovetails whatever you want to make them. There are, there's gonna be a lot of people who have hard and fast things. Hardwoods, you can make them a little smaller because, um, well, because the wood is harder. It doesn't compress as much, and uh, it, you can you can get more strength out of the wood with smaller pieces. So you can, but there's no reason you can't make dovetails and softwood smaller. So I guess it's a personal preference. Though there are people out there oh, that are telling you, Oh, Alan! What? <gasps> Shame on you. He you asked just... if I was standing. <laughs> ah, no, this is the difference. Not much. <laughs> oh, geez. So, same thing for the ripping, except for this one, I have a bigger tooth. The other one was like uh, 10 TPI, and this one is uh, four and a half. Much bigger ripping saw. And it has rip teeth as opposed to cross cut teeth. Okay, I'm getting aggressive there. I'm letting my hand try to force it down in there. And every now and then it catches and it causes the saw to bind. Uh. And I'm just trying to make it quick. And any time I try to speed it up, I'm putting the force into it and I need to let the saw do the work. And what happened there is I pushed it over and it caused this to crack out. If I was putting any more force on there, I probably would have cracked the board farther down. And then we'd go over to the plane to clean it up. We made a small board out of a big board. Oh, that's enough excitement for one night. <laughs> oh, I love that. It, uh, it really doesn't take... Why am I not on the right camera? There we go. It, a lot of people think it takes a lot of arm strength to do that. But if you're putting your force into it with your arm, 
uh, you're doing it wrong. And that's what I was trying to do there. So I was trying to speed it up and just put a lot of force into it. And you can do that, but you're going to end up having more problems like splitting things out or your body mechanic going out of range. And if you slow down a little bit and let the saw do the work, you'll get a much cleaner, straighter cut. Doesn't mean you won't get out of breath because you're still doing cardio workout, which is fun. But I'm weird. Uh, so now let's clean up this side. And now we're fairly close to this line. It should only take a few passes to get this stuff clean. There. Full length, full width. Just like that. Now we have our board that's the right size, but now it's so thick, it's three quarter inch wide. So we're gonna pillow this thing down. Oof, why am I missing Oof. this? Oh, down there, that's why. My dogs fell on the floor. Oh. So I'm gonna use dogs here, which are these little things that go in the holes, dog holes. Hold this in place. Let me bring this over and show you a little bit more of this I can. Yeah, that should do. And I want to let this overhang the bench a little bit. Ah, I'm having fun. This is why I do this, because it's just pure fun. You don't get this excitement when you're uh, doing things with a power tool. So I want to see which side of this do I want up and down. And I want this side to be up. I want this to be the bottom. So I'm going to work on the bottom here. And we're going to pillow this down. I'm going to grab my scrub plane. I'm going to drop oh. my hold fast on the ground. And now we're going to work on this corner. I want to basically bring this edge down to a quarter inch so it fits into that groove. Um, but before I do that, I need to take this apart so I have a groove to test it with. That way I can set this groove on there and see does it fit all the way down. And I'm just going to eyeball this. Go at it with the scrub plane. Take this down. Taking enough off. Let's make this thing a little deeper. Whew. This is where you turn your audio down. Getting close here and probably about yeah, a little less than three eighths. I'm just looking at the edge all the way along here and I'm eyeballing its right thickness. Now if I wanted to, I could come in with a marking gauge, which a lot of people would like to do, set it at a quarter inch. Flip this over and I can mark it down and say, that's the line I need to take it down to. But most of the time, I just eyeball it. Because a quarter inch is pretty easy to eyeball. Pretty close about here, and you spend a little more time on either end. Switch that over. Oop, wrong button. One. I'll stop here and answer a few questions in a second if anyone has any. Let's get this down. And 
let's do a little testing here. See where we're at. Okay, it's just barely fitting on, except for right here. And that's where I want to take it to with the scrub pan. It wants to be just barely fitting on. Now at this point, <laughs> right there, and then I need a little bit more front and back. John Hammock says, okay, James, Sarah's turn. <laughs> hey, there we go. Now it's just barely fitting on all the way across. Now here are a couple different options I can pull out. My number four, or four and a half in this case. And now I can slowly bring it down. And I'm actually going to create an angle here all the way across so that this will then fit in all the way down, all the way to depth, which I got there. And I need a little bit more down at this end, just like one more shaving. Perfect. So. Let me show you what this looks like closer up. Uh, what button do I need? Two. So on this end, I think I'm out of focus here. Sorry about that. Right there. So now you can see how it has a taper on there. And this groove fits in there. And it slides all the way down to depth of the groove. And there's a little bit of slop up and down. Just a little bit. That gap in the corner due to the angle is really going to drive some people crazy. But strength-wise, there's absolutely no difference from this being perfectly square to this having an ang angle on there. And I want to make sure it'll touch the, deep, the depth of that groove all the way along that. Then, for the end on this, it's basically going to be the exact same thing, except for I need to move my dog down so I don't hit it. And in this case, well, what I normally am going to do is I'm going to plane off both both edges, uh, both edges, and then plane off the end because right now if I try to plane this off, I'm going to end up blowing out this corner a good bit. Hey, but we'll be doing that here in a moment. Can what you, you got? Um, focus it again. Oh, now you changed. Excuse. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm playing with the idea. What time is it? Oh, 8:30. Okay, good. I was thinking it was a little later. So I think we all have enough time to do both this because I well. Trying to think if I want to do the if I want to do the glue up live or if I just want to talk through it tonight, because um, that's probably going to take a good 15 minutes. You know, let's do it. Um, or how how are people talking about this being too loud or taking too long? It's I probably going to take me another five minutes or so to pillow this thing. I heard that. What's that? I I haven't heard that you're okay. too loud or taking. Well, then let's do the other side of this. And keep going. Any questions before I jump back in? Um, well, I'll just do the one that just popped up right this second. Okay. Robert Thielen just asked, would it be better to plane the ends first to prevent blowout? No, do the ends second so that there is no blowout. Uh, because if you do the ends first, all of the corners will blow out. Whereas if you do the ends second, there aren't any corners to blow out, which I'll show you that in a minute once we do this side down. Now, if I were making a delicate panel door, I'd bring it really close with this, but then I'd come back with my smoothing plane and make sure everything is really nice and smooth. Unless you wanted that rabbit edge um, all the way around, in which case then you'd use a rabbit plane and then bring it into shape with a, uh, with a regular binge plane. Thank 
getting close. Let's see how close we are. About three or four shavings on that end. This end needs more and I'm getting really close in the middle. There, just on the edge there. Really good in the middle, just on the edge there. So let's bring in the number five, smooth this out, skew it at a bit of an angle. And that should get me right about where I want to be. Check, check it again. Good depth all the way along. There we go. One more shaving right here on the end. There we go, perfect. Now we can do the ends of this. And now that we've tapered this out, you can see how much easier this is gonna be right here. Because we're only have to take this little bit here. So now when I go across, I'm still gonna use the scrub plane here. This really scares a lot of people with having the wooden dog right here. And they're like, oh, what are you going to do? Hit your blade. It's aluminum. It's okay. You can plane aluminum. And the nice thing is, I know that this corner is right, and I know that this corner is right. And so once I get it close, now I can bring in the number four. And I'm actually going to back it off because I need to get a little closer. So open this vise all the way up, which I was hoping to stay away from, but oh well. And I'm skewing the blade so that most of its force is going with the grain, even though I'm going across. I'm trying to get that spot right there. Now I can fit that on there. And that's what I'm looking for. And I know I need a little bit more in the middle. A little bit thick right there. So let's go the opposite direction. See how that works. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. Do the same thing on the other end. And we will have a bottom ready to go on this thing. If I really wanted to, I could flatten this out. See how close we are now. Ooh, went a little too far actually. Just a couple more passes over here. See all these sweat drops? I love that. There we go. Now we have a bottom. Who needs BO? Ready for the fun. Just use BO. What's that? That thing. Okay. Man, I love this. <sighs> you know you are weird when you really enjoy the, uh, the sweat and the cardiovascular workout. Because it's really not that much of a muscle workout. Um, it's just more of that cardio workout to keep it going. So that's why I don't, I don't have a massive upper body from hand tool woodworking. Um, but I do have the benefit of running for cardio. Uh-oh, she's laughing. Waiting for Don T to chime in. About what? Uh -oh. he goes, First, you're using a dangerous handsaw with your children around, and now you've got the shavings creating a fire hazard. Next, Sarah will be letting all the kids let cake batter off. Second, I lost my signal. Oh, is not even listening to me? Like that's it. I, I was listening to you. Sorry. Sarah's working too hard. <laughs> 
You know what? Did you unplug me? I didn't unplug you. No. Oh. Here we go. Take B back to three. Here we go. <laughs> Sarah likes a spinning G. <laughs> so, let's see how this bottom fits. Slide this into there. Slide it all the way down. No, and signal. then are we better now? We can put this on. There, I just fixed it. And there we go. We got a box with a bottom, and now it's actually a cradle. Did they see you put the bottom in? What's that? Or did it signal out when you did put the? No, bottom? I just put it on there. Okay. They they just saw that. But it's rocking. Why is it rocking? Uh, because it's sticking out on the bottom. The bottom is three quarter inch thick, so it's sticking out a quarter inch more than the uh, bottom, which is perfectly fine because it's going to be mounted to a building, so nothing's going to be resting on the bottom of this. So let's do a glue up. Woohoo! Let's take this apart first. It's the Sarah. It's always the Sarah show. Come on. Yes. This is Sarah's show. I'm just here for the coffee. Hot chocolate. Hot chocolate. Hot chocolate, yes. I'm here for the hot chocolate. Hot, hot, hot okay, glue up time. Now, here's the question. This thing is going to be outside in the <laughs> weather, um, which means I should use a waterproof glue. And a lot of people are going to tell me to use Type Bond 3. But in my glue test that I did a while ago, I do not trust Type Bond 3 with this. So I'm going to do this. Uh, without that. Now, what you can do if you don't want to use glue, which I have thought about doing with this, is you can actually put pins through your tails. So if I put this on here, so if this slides down in, I can put a pin through the pins into the tailboard, and that will stop this from coming back out. And so if I wanted to, I usually just clamp it up and drill a hole through each of the pins into the tailboard, drive in a dowel, and then I wouldn't have to use glue on this at all, and it can be outside without glue. But in this case, I do want to use glue. And so what I do trust for that is epoxy, which I want to get out here and work with. I'm going to be using a slightly slower set West System epoxy. Oh, I should have taken advantage of you not being in the window at all. Me what? I said I should take advantage of you not being in the window at all. Well, what's going to stop you? I have nothing. <laughs> the nice thing about the West System is that this is, it, it's just really good stuff. I actually worked on an airplane made with this. Two, I'm gonna do four, three. Mm -hmm. I'm using the fast version of this. <laughs> do this one. One. I'm on a, up, 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 up. Why are you stuck? What questions we got? Um, let's see. S. Ritchie has a question, but first, S. Ritchie, I believe your daughter won one of our t-shirts a long time ago. Did we get a picture? I'd love to see a Wood by Right shirt picture. Anyone who won them, put on the hive mind. Anyways, <laughs> on. Um, S. Ritchie asked, so I wonder how they would flatten the backs of chisels and plain irons back in the antique days with their not flat oil stones, or did they use something else? <laughs> okay, Google, set timer for one minute. Um, the idea of flatness and true, perfectly flatness is a newer problem that people have. It is a mindset that comes from the machinist. And if it is as flat as your flattest piece of wood, it's flat enough. Um, the idea that a plain sole needs to be perfectly flat or that a chisel back needs to be perfectly flat is ludicrous. Um, if it is as flat as you will get with your wood from a plane that is perfectly flat, that is f more than flat enough. Um, now you're gonna have all sorts of people out there say, no, it's gotta be within a 10,000th of an inch, or that's uh, just, you don't have to do that. Um, so if a, if a board is flat enough that when you put a, um, put a straight edge on it and, and, and check it with that, that's, perfectly close enough. Um, so in all honesty, you would, have a, you would have a stone that you'd rub against another stone and you'd make them flat. Um, did it do that upstairs? Okay, Google, thank you. Why is it out there? The upstairs one caught it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Google, 
stop timer. Okay, Google, stop kitchen timer. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can you mind her? <laughs> For some reason, our Google timer upstairs got it. Ooh, I need a brush. Um, yeah, so flatness is, it's one of those topics that a lot of people really like to overdo and you don't really need to. Um, <laughs> and I'll honestly, I, I, I show when I flatten planes, I have a piece of glass that I put on my bench top and I use sandpaper on that and I'll flatten them out on that. But in reality, um, if I didn't have the glass sitting right there, I just use my wooden bench top. Uh, there's no reason to have anything that is harder or perfectly flatter than that. That's all you need to flatten a plane blade um, or an iron. <laughs> yeah. So don't don't overthink <laughs> flatness. What? Matthew Mutton phone just said you're welcome. <laughs> Everybody's or, phones who have Google are trying to listen to. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I gotta grab some cardboard to put down. Otherwise, I'm gonna get epoxy all over my bench. That's okay. When I used to call one of the pharmacists at work, he would say hello, Sarah, and his Siri would kick kicking in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's glue this thing up now. With uh, with Oh, with dovetails, the only thing you need to really glue up are the sides of the pins and the sides of the tails. Getting glue on the bottoms, the end grain, really doesn't make any difference because the end grain glue up, especially on an exterior glue up, is, is kind of pointless. Uh, so I'm going to stick this in here and I'm just going to slop this on. And I'm not going to care about this being really clean because I'm going to come back and plane it all off smooth once the epoxy dries. And I know I'm really freaking a lot of people out there because there's some idea that you can't use epoxy when you work with hand tools. Uh, it's not a traditional method. Well, I'm not a traditional woodworker. Um, and epoxy really is the best glue for the job. Let's see. Front, back. Cool. So let's get this one. Front is this way, right? No, that's back. So front goes this way. Hey, there we go. And so I'm gonna make sure I get glue on the sides of the pin. And I am going to slop some on the bottom, but I'm not going to overthink it. And on this particular case, if anything squeezes out on the inside, oh well. And most of the time I really don't care because I'm going to come back with a chisel and clean it out anyways. Um, so I'm not the perfectionist when it comes to this, even though my wife thinks I'm a perfectionist. I don't know what's wrong with her. She married me. That's I was going to say. I'm... <laughs> what other questions we got? Uh, let's see. Um, Daniel Schumann asked, didn't know if you knew off the top of your head, but when is the next moon Midwest annual tool collector meet? Or antique tool, not annual. Uh, the next one is here in Loves Park uh, this Sunday. Um, the next national is in June. It's mid-June. Um, and that is in Peoria, Illinois. And that is the big one. Um, that's the one Sarah and I will both be at, yes. but that one is, um, that one, okay, imagine for a moment um, a basketball court completely covered with tables, and every one of those tables is completely covered with hand tools, and they are all for sale. Um, that's, that's what a tool collector's meet is, but the national ones take it a step farther, and on Thursdays they have the, uh, the parking lot sale, and those ones you can usually get a much better price and they're slightly cheaper, a little more rusted tools, um, but it's often just as many or more than you get at some of the indoor ones. But it's a lot of the cheaper stuff so people just sell it out of the back of their cars, they don't have to carry it inside. And that's also where I can get a lot of the big tools. So there's that. Take your kids, sometimes you get better deals. <laughs> yes, they, they do like giving things away to kids. So walk by the Stanley 55s and say, oh, my kids would love a Stanley 55. <laughs> there we go. Now let's and glue this thing up. take your daughters because then they'll ask questions and then they'll be shocked they actually know the answer. <laughs> now, um, I don't want to get glue on the bottom. I, I could glue it in, and in which case I just put it on the tips, of the, the middle of the end grain. But the problem is I want this bottom to be able to move, expand, and contract. Um, 
Yeah, let's do that first. So I'm gonna grab a couple of my beam clamps and put them on here. Now, a lot of people like to put calls on so they're making put making the pressure dead on the ends of the boards and eh, I think it's overkill. I'm making sure that I don't put these on a spot of glue because I want to be able to take them off when they're done. So I'm going to put one on this side. No reason to really cramp this, clamp this down. If your joinery is good, you don't need to worry about getting it really tight. You just want to get it close. There we go. Flip it over, put two on the other side. What questions we got? All right. Um, let's see. Levi DeVal says, I'm just starting out woodworking. Any tips for novices? <laughs> um, don't be afraid to mess up. A lot of people are so frightened to make mistakes that it stops them from woodworking. Uh, mistakes are a fantastic way to learn. And when you make a mistake, it is there's a, a personal thing to it that if you don't make it a personal problem, it becomes so much more fun. Uh, and it's so much, so much more to be just saying, oh, okay. I can learn from that as opposed to, I'm a failure, this is horrible, I don't want to show it to anyone. And uh, for my 100 subscriber video, which I'm going to be soon coming up to 100 subscribers, probably the end of April, early May, um, I'm actually going to do a video where I walk around the house and I show 100 defects in all the things throughout my ho house that I've made. I hope you and plan show all these little before details. you do that. No, I'm showing the defects of the house. Everyone knows that I'm the one who's responsible for cleaning, right? So there we go. We got our box. Um, and next time we are going to go through and do the, the cleanup, the smoothing out, and maybe a little bit of carving. Um, we'll see about that. But we're just going to set this aside to, to dry. This, um, the fast system, I could probably work on it in six hours. Hey, and, John. But I want to give it 24 to let it sit. Oh, someone else. Yep, John Burkett. Sorry, I'd pull up the light, but it's it's jammed down in there. So let's see, what joke does John get? Yeah, looking forward to seeing you. Uh, John said he was going to be there on Sunday. So if you Saturday. are... Saturday. It's to... Saturday. The 13th is Saturday. No, it's the 14th. Well, you keep saying the 13th. No, the 14th. Sunday. You are changing it. <laughs> um... <laughs> yes, be power. Yes. Uh, yeah, there's a there's a graveyard just down the road over here. It's totally crowded. People are dying to get in there. Seriously, dude. What? Come on. <laughs> what? That's like a fourth grader. Is it? Oh, okay, yes. I'll do another one here. <laughs> a woman is on trial for beating her husband to death with a guitar collection. <laughs> the judge asks, uh, "Is she a first offender?" And she says, no, first it was a Gibson and then a Fender. That's a little better. <laughs> uh, if you have any epoxy left over, a tip. Um, this has about an inch of epoxy in it, which means that it probably won't heat too much. Um, but if you have like an inch and a half, two inches or more, uh, you want to be very careful with this cup because it's, it's already getting a little warm. Um, I've actually had times where the cups have burst on flames, uh, particularly if you're in a paper cup because they'll heat up to the point that whatever's holding it um, catches fire. In this case, I know this is pretty good, but I'm still going to set it over here on the concrete um, and I'll keep an eye on it. <laughs> I don't know if I should be concerned now. <laughs> yes, epoxy <laughs> is exothermic, so as it cures, it uh, heats up. And I've actually, I've seen them burst into flames. Um, so don't, uh, it has more to do with its volume. So if you spread it out thinner so that it has more surface area to, uh, to uh, cast off heat, then it's less of a problem. So what other questions we got? Um, let's see. Going back to the saw going wibble wobble thing, um, R. Tani asked, is that why my rip cuts twist in large pieces? Um, yeah, so you're saying that when you're cutting, the saw curved slowly turns one way. That's usually a body mechanic thing, that your body is either in the way or too far out of the way, and it's pushing your arm one way or the other. You want to focus on keeping your shoulder directly on top of your work. 
so that your arm can be perfectly in alignment. You don't want your arm in the way so that it's kind of doing one of these numbers going out of the way. You want the ah. whole thing perfectly in line as it's going in and out. They have much better dad jokes than you. And that's, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'll have to work on my dad jokes. Will a $100 super chat get me a fire? <laughs> 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 if I wasn't here, yes, it would. <laughs> 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 I, I I've never been. Although JJ does know how to use a fire extinguisher. <laughs> I've never been called a pyro, have I? <laughs> There's a reason I enjoyed doing the uh, the boiled Lindsay oil catching on fire video. That was a fun one. Cool. What else we got? Uh, let's see. Troy Jacobson asked, "What are the most common mistakes made trying to turn the burr on a card scraper?" I've been oh. trying several different techniques and can't get anything to work. Um, yeah, but before I do that, who is it? Uh, Jim Dockle said, spread the epoxy on the floor. You're used to that. <laughs> yeah, for those of you who don't know, I dumped out like three gallons of epoxy on my floor um, accidentally. But uh, yeah. Oops. Um, the, what was the question? <laughs> what are the most common mistakes Ah, made? turning a burr. Yes, thank you. Uh, the most common mistake is the idea that there is one way to do it. Um, and there really isn't. There are hundreds of ways to do it, and most people just have to try a bunch of different ways until they find a way that works for them. And um, so I, I show people the way I like to do it, um, but everyone's a little bit different. Uh, the, the easiest way for me to turn a burr is actually to take a mill file, and so when I'm, when I'm prepping this, I want to clean the surface because over time, they'll, they'll start to get some undulations as some spots where the burr has broken off. And I'm going to take a file, and I literally put it down here on the bench, and I look at, eh, it looks about 90 degrees. Some people actually have a file holder that will keep it exactly 90 degrees. I don't mess with that. Um, and I'm just going to bring it back along here, three or four strokes. And in just three or four strokes on the file, I'm going to get a burr on there. I'm actually going to grab a test piece and play with this. Um, yeah, not right now. Uh, I'll get a burr on there, and you can just use the burr off of this. Now, it's a much bigger burr, and it's a little bit more of a uh, um, uh, more crunky. It has a lot more ins and outs on it. Um, and so it's not great for your detail and your finish work, um, but it will do a burr that will take off material fairly quickly. And so a lot of times I'll just do that when I'm trying to get through some tear out and get down to a surface. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it over to the, the stones, and I'll get a perfectly flat edge there, a flat edge on the sides, and I'll actually turn this into a perfectly square edge. And then I'll use my burnisher to do it. Um, from that point on, the two most common mistakes I see is number one, people are using something that is too soft. Um, so they're using the side of a screwdriver or, um, or they're using a, uh, I've seen a bunch of different things, just a piece of steel. You want something that's pretty hard. You want something that has been hardened. So if you have a file with a safe edge on it, in other words, it doesn't have its, it doesn't have the edging on there, you can actually use that to be a burnisher because the file is a much harder steel. Um, I actually have a carbide rod, a quarter inch carbide rod that I use um, to do that. The other thing is the angle at which you do it. Like this is 90 degrees off there and a lot of people will turn their burr with it almost at a 45 degree angle across there. What that's doing is it's just driving that corner down in and you're not going to get a burr, you're just going to be messing up the corner you just did. What I like to do is put it at like 5 degrees or 10 degrees, just ever so slightly off. And then as I move it, I'm going to be pulling it across. So as I move it forward, I'm also pulling it across. So I'm starting here and I'm pulling it out. There's just a little bit of an angle on there. And that's all that I do to get that nice fine burr that I'm looking for. Um, so don't try and over, don't try and be over aggressive on that angle. Um, just a tiny bit of angle is all you need. Now that being said, everyone out there is going to have a different method and a different way of doing it. So <laughs> it's it's really about finding the method that works for you and uh, and going for that. But so. yours is the right way. Yes, yes. Um, but I have a a video where I go into it and how I do it. Um, one of my other favorite ones is one by Bearcat Woodworking, and he actually sells. Let's see if I can pull it out. He has these little. Um, things that he sells that are, oh, here, let me switch over to this. Hoo -hoo, focus. There we go. This thing in here actually has a carbide rod. And if you look at it, 
it's at an ever so slight angle that way. And so when you slide this along the card, you're actually rubbing the burr on the far side. And so he'll just do that, flip it over, and then do that and get your burr. Um, and it works really well. So yeah, a lot of people like these things in here. They're even, for some of the thinner ones, he has a, a gap in there so you can slide inside and dry it on that. Um, but these are, are kind of a cool thing, Bearcat Woodworking. Um, I don't use as much because I like the, the handheld version, but that's me. Mess around with it until you find something that, uh, that works for you. <laughs> what else we got? All right, so Harry McCall asked, why do you put the flat part inside the box instead of outside? Um, in this particular box, I guess it really doesn't matter because it's going to be filled with dirt. Um, but usually you want the inside of your box to be perfectly flat. Um, so yeah, I guess I could have put it the other way. But for something that's hanging on the side of the wall, I kind of like the look of it hanging down. Completely personal preference. I like it that way than other ways, so that's why I did it. <laughs> because you could. All right. Okay, so back, follow up to S. Ritchie's earlier question about flattening the backs of chisels. It says, okay, but what about a chisel? Doesn't the back need to be flat for the chisel to be sharp? Yes, it needs to be flat, but it doesn't need to be dead flat, thousandths of an inch flat. Um, it just needs to be flat-ish. Um, people really worry about that being dead flat. Um, and if you're talking about, yeah, let me grab one of my, oh, here. Let me grab my little chisel. And this will make it a little easier to explain. Um, there's, there's several different types of flat. Number one, there's flat across the whole surface. If, if you are out of flat across the whole surface by a 64th of an inch, um, that's pretty darn out of flat, but you can still make that chisel work. Um, there's, there's no reason for it to be dead flat all the way across. If you're out of flat by a few thousands, then it's completely flat enough. Um, then there is flat right across the tip. And you want it to be nice and flat all the way across the tip. Well, for most chisels, this is only like a half inch wide or three quarter inch, or if you have a really big one, a full inch wide. And so that amount of flatness, you can eyeball. Um, and so even if the stone has a bit of a curvature to it, the amount of curvature it, it, it would have to have in order for that to be a problem would be something that would be very obvious over the course of an eight inch stone. Um, so even flattening out a stone that is ever so slightly out of flat is... Um, more than enough than what you need over the, the width of the chisel. Um, so, yeah, uh, I think that's one of the things that a lot of people like to, to overthink. So I hope that answers your question. Um, but yeah, it doesn't have to be perfectly flat. What else we got? Um, Russell Clark asked, uh, how do you feel about Japanese dovetail saws? I just got one and I'm looking forward to trying the full stroke. Work great. Um, a lot of people really like them. I'm not a huge fan of it. I don't like the body mechanic of pulling, um, but really that tends to be what you were brought up on, what you were trained on, or what you've spent more time with. Um, pulling, pushing, they both work great. Some people really find them um, easier. Uh, the, the big difference between pull and push is, yeah, let me get this one out. Um, when you're pulling, the leading teeth that are cutting are on the other side of the board from you. And so there's nothing going to be affecting the other side of the blade. Even if you're twisting this way out on the side, there's nothing affecting the teeth on the far side. So it takes a lot of force to make the saw turn when you're pulling it. When you're pushing, the, the teeth that are initiating the cut are on your side of the board. So any little bit of movement in the handle is going to make the saw curve go out of the way. And that's the problem with most people when they're first getting into it is that they're overcorrecting and they're putting more force into it or the body mechanic is out. And so the saw is going different ways. And so when you're, when you're pushing and you're new, it's a lot more to think through. Whereas if you're new and you're pulling, as long as you set the saw straight to begin with, it's going to keep on going down as long as the saw is good. Um, and so that's why it's easier for a beginner to learn to pull than it is to push. Um, but once you have learned how to do it, pushing gives you far more control. So you can turn the saw when you need to. Um, but six of one, half dozen of another. Um, they were great though. Um, I, I don't use them, but that's because I like pushing. <laughs> but it's another skill to learn, so. Yeah, you like pushing buttons, but anyways. What's that? Oh, nothing. I don't know what you're talking about, babe. 
All right, two more quick questions, and then we have to do a giveaway because they are asking. Oh, yeah, we need to do a giveaway for next okay, week. Call two more questions, time. and then we'll be done with questions. Okay. Yeah. Levi Del Valley asked, what saw is good for box joints? Um, whatever saw you have on hand. Um, in all honesty, a, a, a box joints are boring dovetails. Um, or Are you talking about finger joints or box because a box joint can be any joint you use to make a box. Um, but I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about um, uh, finger joints. Um, those are basically just straight dovetails. Um, so a dovetail saw works great for that. Um, you cut them the exact same way as you would cut a dovetail. They just, uh, they are, they are harder because everything has to be precisely 90 degrees. And it just makes it a little bit more annoying for me, but whatever. <laughs> but basically any saw, I mean, if you don't have a good dovetail saw, then a hacksaw, works really well. I'm a hacksaw. We can make a, a good dovetail saw. What else you got? All right. And then John Burkett, off topic, but have you ever considered making a mold of your shoes and pouring them in epoxy? <laughs> now that would be a good video. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll think about that. That would be a, that would be a fun one. <laughs> While wearing your Bob Ross wig. No. <laughs> yes. Now I'll, I'll cast the Bob Ross wig in epoxy. <laughs> yeah, right. that would that would be fun, John. Maybe maybe I'll have to think that one through someday. Okay, what's the sweet question? Oh, how many hairs does James have on his head? <laughs> <laughs> okay, the question for this week, and we are going to be giving out a uh, card scraper. So, if you want to win one of my card scrapers, which you can buy on my website, and they are the uh, Wood by Right Blue Card Scraper, and they come with a thumb scraper, a thumb saver. <laughs> A thumb scraper, <laughs> uh, which uh, for those of you who don't know, it is Jason, basically it's a it's a wood by right refrigerator magnet. But you put it on there, and it actually saves your thumbs because if you're doing a lot of it, the card scraper heats up big time and it can hurt your thumbs. But just putting a magnet on the back keeps the heat off of your thumbs, and you can go a lot longer. So so don't yeah, mix that magnet. and your epoxy with the heat. <laughs> yes. Um, Oh yes. Uh, so the uh, the win in order to do this, um, don't put it in the live chat right now, but put it in the comments once this video goes uh, live. Once it goes actual, um, how many bibs do I have hanging on my wall behind Sarah? And yes, you can try to count oh, them. Oh, racing bibs. Yes. How many racing bibs do I have? The numbers hanging behind Sarah. You can try to count them, but a lot of them are three or four deep, or more. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna count them up. I'm and, not uh, necessarily against bribery. <laughs> the person who comes closest i will give you a card scraper next week so put your guest down below and we'll get to that uh, so next week we're going to be doing the finish up on this and getting that all ready to hang outside um, i don't know if i'm going to be doing finish i haven't chosen which one i want to do on that but uh, we'll seriously get there. what's that what finish do what? you do any other kind of finish not for outside boiled linseed oil is not a good out exterior oh. finish okay um, yeah, so we'll be getting there. Not yet, Alan. Wait, <laughs> you listen to directions. Cool. Am I forgetting anything else? No, but uh, as Richie said, can you cut some dovetails with your one man, the slick? So your one man saw and then your slick. Can oh, yeah. Now, those would be some fun dovetails. <laughs> Not yet, people. Wait. Actually, I'm hoping to just do a video here soon showing how to sharpen the, uh, uh, the, the two crosscut saws. So that should be uh, coming out here soon. But, yeah. Sarah, Sarah, we go way back. Yeah. Just remember, he's put on a lot of miles. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You're getting close, Alan. Getting close. Cool. Um, well, I think that about does it for this okay. week. Nine ten. You can start posting. <laughs> Did I forget anything? I don't know. Cool. Well, until next time, have a wonderful day.